Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, everyone. Welcome to a special conference coverage episode of Human Factors Cast. We're recording this on July 20th, 2022. I'm your host, Nick Rome. On this episode, we're going to be recapping the International Symposium on Human Factors and Ergonomics in Healthcare 2022. Across the internet from me is our guest, Mr. Joe Keebler, chair of the Human Factors Healthcare Symposium. Joe, welcome back to the show. It's funny that uh, you've been on, but we have never actually communicated on this medium before. It's true. Thank you so much for having me, Nick, and for covering the, uh, the event or the events, I should say. Yeah, well, thank you for being here. Um, so I guess, you know, we can kind of just jump right into uh, the the healthcare symposium. I know we've we've done coverage about this event in the past, but uh, really, uh, can you walk us through a little bit of the history on how this event started and how we got to where we are today? Sure. And, you know, uh, Tony Andre could fill in some of the earlier details. I believe it came out of when he was president of the Team Factor Society was when the idea and the original conference was kind of uh, started. I didn't get involved until 2013 or so, um, but I believe the symposium was started because there was a need both from the medical side, needing more safety and HF science in their world for a variety of reasons and career paths for, for our folks. So um, I think there was just a need there. There's a variety of Research that came out in the late 90s, early 2000s, making a call for improvements in patient safety. And a lot of that looked towards our science for that. And so um, the conference obviously was needed because it's been growing ever since and we're larger now than we've ever been. The pandemic obviously caused some lower numbers in some of the conference attendance because we had to kind of cancel an event and shift it to an online event. But um, I think we're doing very well. And as a science, I think we're more involved in medicine now than we've ever been, which is exciting. So. Yeah. And thinking about the pandemic, I can imagine that opened a lot of doors for some human factors, healthcare research. And so I, I, this is just kind of satisfying my own curiosity. Sorry, everyone, this isn't on the notes, but like how, how is the content uh, a little bit different from years past with so much, I guess, I don't want to say focus on the pandemic, but having that being um, sort of more prevalent in our lives, how does that, how does that change? Everything. Oh, I think, well, first off, I think that a lot of research got stalled. Um, uh, a lot of folks that had access to hospitals uh, were doing research in live medical settings that had to cease for maybe a year or two years uh, until the pandemic kind of cooled down. So I think a lot of people got stuck, you know, not being able to collect their data or had a project. And I, this happened to me too, where I had to just wait for months because we couldn't do IRB approvals. We couldn't do the things we need to do to do our research uh, and, and hospitals. The last thing they're thinking about is research. They're thinking about, you know, dealing with the pandemic and all the, the, the fallout from that. Um, but we did see as the the year passed, the next conference came up, lots of folks submitting research around COVID and the interventions they used and how human factors helped with things like uh, personal protective equipment and other, you know, I, I don't really do research on this, but there's been a variety of papers and submissions surrounding HF applications for, you know, pandemic safety in a, in a sense. I, I don't know what else, how else to frame it, but how to prepare hospitals, teams, and hospitals to deal with you know lots of sick patients. Um, right. And so our field, I think, I think in some ways it probably really helped ingrain folks doing this kind of work that were already there and help them kind of show that the science could be really useful uh, for a variety of things that probably people weren't thinking about when the pandemic started. But I think it probably also led to a slowdown of certain kinds of research projects and a lot of folks probably waiting months to years to get their research program started back up. Yeah. And now that we're kind of, quote unquote, out of this thing, right? I, I mean, I'd imagine there's kind of a surge now of, of all this research that's coming in that, uh, you know, as they catch up. I think so. And, um, you know, we have the new journal, the Human Factors and Healthcare Journal now with a Selvier. And that, from my perspective, it's brand new journal. It's not even been a year and it's, we have so many articles already and they're all free to the public. So that's really a great resource, but you're, yeah, you're seeing that's that picked up a lot. And then this year in New Orleans was almost back to normal. Um, we were a little bit shy in regards to the uh, size of attendance compared to Chicago of 
2019, I believe. I don't, I don't remember which year the pandemic started. I think it was 2020 when we had to stop the trip to Toronto and pivoted online. But um, uh, the Chicago event was a little bit larger, but we're, we're kind of back to normal now. So the research is back, I think, in full swing and people are getting back to working with hospitals again. And I know I am um, where some of our work just totally ceased because hospitals are like, we're not letting anyone in that's not, you know, a patient or a provider. Um, right. So, yeah. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad we're kind of getting back there now. Just, <laughs> could you kind of just give us a little bit of overview about what the conference is? I know we've been kind of hinting at it, talking about it just for those who haven't attended, have never heard about it, new to the show, something like that. Give us a little bit about what this conference is. Sure. So it is a, uh, HFES sponsored conference. So the human factors ergonomic society is kind of running it. And I, I work as the chair of it through HFES, but it's very outward facing. Um, towards medical providers, administrators, uh, medical device design companies, uh, you know, consultancies. And so when I mean outward facing, you know, half of our attendees are are not HFES folks per se, are not necessarily uh, HF trained individuals or um, students or whatever. So we, we have a lot of medical providers, nurses and doctors. We have a lot of hospital admin folks that come to learn about what people are doing with human factors in a variety of settings. Uh, so we have five tracks and, and, you know, it's a conference, so it is a two and a half day conference and it's mainly based around lectures, uh, panels and, and poster presentations. So it's people coming and showing their scientific work. So the, fundamentally, it's just like any other conference. But because of the outward facing nature of it, we have a lot of applied. The tracks are very applied. So the way it's broken up is into five tracks. We have one on digital health, which is all about the medical technologies, especially digital technologies like uh, electronic medical records and health records. We have education simulation, which is about um, how we're using cutting edge technologies to train medical providers and medical students. Hospital environments, which focuses on applying human factors and ergonomics to um, studying and, and implementing changes within hospitals, kind of at a maybe a macro ergonomic scale, but it could also be something like redesigning a hospital room or it could be more safety initiatives, um, which ties to the other track, which is patient safety, which is very focused on patient safety changes, things that lead to safer care, reducing errors, things like that. And then medical device and drug delivery, which is probably our most popular track, which is all about usability and creation and FDA validation of medical devices. And so a lot of those talks are, we have workshops from the FDA, we have talks about various devices and, and interfaces being designed by, um, you know, all kinds of companies across the world that talk to the audience about what they're doing with their technologies and how they got them approved by the FDA or whatever governing body oversees those technologies. Um, and even our keynote speaker this year was Matt Weinger and his whole keynote was about a medical device that he you know, had been working on for decades. Um, so that's a big part of the conference because you know, we have really good attendance throughout, but whenever you go to the face to face conference that the medical device room is always the you know, full to the doors pretty much. Um, not to say that any of these other tracks are less important, but, that's where a lot of the jobs are. I think a lot of the, you know, the folks getting hired in this environment are getting hired to design medical devices and working in those, those domains. So. Yeah, it right. feels, I was going to say, it feels um, like that. So full disclosure, I've never actually been to this event in person. Uh, oh, okay. I've been meaning to go. <laughs> I've been meaning to go. Um, and it, it's on my bucket list of things to do. Uh, almost went in uh, this year in person, but uh, things didn't quite line up, but I, I, I Really appreciate the the sort of picture that you're painting here of uh, the physical conference and sort of what um, I, I wouldn't say the popularity of necessarily of each track, but sort of the um, the level of uh, I, I'm going to say the level of commitment to each track and sort of the uh, the attendance about each track. It it really gives a good sense of kind of where the industry's at, and we can talk a little bit towards the end about. Um, trends in in human factors healthcare uh, and what the future might hold um sure. but can you elaborate just a little bit more on sort of the physical event or i guess let's let's actually back up a minute and talk about the venue overall right we talked about the conference let's talk a little bit about the venue this year because it's a little bit different because it's new orleans you mean well because because there were two components to it <laughs> oh sure so well it's funny because you said i they Yes, it was kind of like two separate events in a way, but I see what you're saying. Um, right. Really, you know, the face-to-face -face conference. So maybe we should talk a little of the history here. So 
we have the first decade of the conference was always face to face, and we've been in a variety of cities like Chicago, Baltimore. We had it in New Orleans a couple of times, um, and slowly that was growing over time. Then the pandemic happened. We were supposed to be in Toronto that year, and it got canceled um, because the pandemic was it, the event was like a week out, and we just had a lot of people emailing and worried and you know panicking. And, and I don't blame them. I probably was myself. It was just like no one wanted to get on a plane, no one wanted to be stuck in another country, you know, coming from the U.S. to Canada or vice versa and, and get stuck because they caught COVID and now you know, to be quarantined for 18 days or whatever. So it was all brand new. This canceling just made sense. It's a healthcare conference. We should be conscientious about who we serve and, and our job as safety professionals. It's kind of a smart thing to cancel a conference in the middle of the pandemic. So we pivoted to an online conference a couple months later. So we went from the face-to-face -face and canceled entirely. And then we went to an online format and basically ported the entire thing online as best we could. You know, obviously we had some attrition, um, but the conference was very well attended. I mean, we were probably face to face getting 500 attendees. And for that first online event, we had like 800 or something like that because so many people could attend that wouldn't have been able to for other reasons. So we being online, we found out, okay, well, this opens it up to a variety of professionals, maybe younger folks who can't afford to go to a conference. Maybe people who are international can't afford or don't have the time to come across, you know, to the United States or to Canada. So. Then we did the virtual one again the following year because the pandemic was still full force. And then this year, we, you know, things were cooling down and we decided to go face to face. But then the question remained of, well, are we still providing content for these folks online? And that's why we did two events because we assume that some people are still going to come to face to face. We'll get that normal attendance we were getting for those first eight or nine years. But there's probably some set of people, students and international people. and folks who couldn't travel to a face-to-face -face conference because they still couldn't risk COVID for a variety of reasons that we were still serving. And I think it ended up being, you know, we had a pretty good attendance for both considering. Um, so we figured that it was filling a need there, Nick, that the online component would serve different folks. Maybe some people would be at the same both, but most people would probably be at the online one because whatever, you know, circumstances there and it was easier for them to attend that than a face-to-face -face in New Orleans. Um, yeah. So, so, is that what you is that what you found? Is that the online one this year is was it more attended? Is that something you could talk well, about? Well, look at it. So we canceled, and then we had a pretty big attendance. But then, if you look at it, it wasn't quite added up to splitting. But we um, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I believe we had around four hundred or so attendees in New Orleans. I think we had around two hundred in the online, um, which in my mind is not bad. Uh, I think we're no. okay, you know? and we're a nonprofit. I think it's smart that we make. Uh, you know, money where we can to, to keep our society alive and have funding. But at the end of the day, as long as we're getting our content out there, I believe that having the conference and as long as it pays for itself, then it's worth it. Right. So I think it was a win for both. And I don't, it's a lot of work. I don't know if we'll be doing it every year. Um, we now have three kind of healthcare events because we have the main HFBS conference, which has its own track. That's HCTG, the healthcare TG, uh, and they have their own content. And then we have the healthcare symposium that's face to face. And then maybe this, virtual event that's maybe every year, every two years, that, that's not up to me, that's up to the executive council and, and other folks to decide that. But I think this is our kind of proof of concept of uh, it worked and uh, it might've been worth it. And maybe it's worth it to have it at some interval every you know year or every two years or something. So I think it was a, it was a win uh, to, for both. And the face-to-face -face conference was a success and we didn't have, I believe like there was you know one person reported COVID after the conference was over. So it's like, who knows where they caught it, but there wasn't like, I've heard of other conferences where there's like outbreaks and stuff. So we didn't, we right. were very safe. There was vaccination cards required and masking. So we played it very safe because, you know, half the attendees are medical providers. We can't be having MDs come to our conference and catching COVID. Um, you know, I think it just looks really strange to be a safety science and not be as safe as possible. Uh, but I do think having a face-to-face -face event as someone who, you know, hadn't been to anything like that in years because of the, because of the pandemic, it was really nice to just be back face-to-face -face with people. So I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I mean, it nothing beats that face to face networking that you, you know you can pull somebody aside into a, a corner and just say, "Hey, yeah, like, really friends. appreciate that." Yeah, exactly. Not so, yeah, that for meeting new people. So, yeah. Um, asked, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Layout. So, um, I'm happy to talk about that. You had said you, you, that was your original question. Then we had back. Yeah, up. yeah. T tell tell me about sort of um, New Orleans. Just tell me about how it was this year. It was great, and it was really nice weather. Um, the conference is in, it was in Hilton, I believe. And, um, I think so. And I apologize if I'm wrong about that. 
uh, but we use the conference center and we usually have four rooms that each track gets a room. And then in between the rooms, there's, you know, coffee and water and snacks and, and, and the vendors get various desks to show off for jobs or, or advertise. Um, and then, so it went very well and we had two and a half days of content. Um, uh, I think it went out without a hitch really. And then at night we have poster sessions. Um, there was a tornado that hit New Orleans the second night. That was unfortunate because there was a fundraising event that a lot of people end up not going to because there's this tornado in the city. Uh, but really the conference went very well and um, really interesting talks, stuff about COVID. I saw a couple of talks on that were really compelling. Um, so it's, it's nice because it's really intimate. It's small, only 400 people, which is a relatively small conference. And so everyone convenes after each um, session ends and can kind of meet with each other in the middle hallway. And, and the poster event is everyone goes to the poster events for the most part. So um, you just get the whole conference there. So if there's someone you want to talk to, you saw a talk, like you were saying, it's very easy to find them, which I find really nice. I've been to much larger conferences that that's basically impossible. So, um, so it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice event. That's if you really want to learn about the stuff and meet some of the, you know, top people doing human factors, medical research and, and application, this is like the place to be, I think. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And, and so like you said, there's the physical component, but then there's also this virtual event that in a lot of ways you said is completely different or a separate event. Um, and can you kind of talk a little bit through that? Like, what is, what does it look like? Uh, yeah, I, I've seen it, but for others who haven't, what does it look like? Uh, so the, the original virtual, so there's kind of like two virtual events because the first two years were in lieu of the face-to-face. -face. Those events had a lot more kind of, uh, there was like a whole, almost like virtual conference software we're using to like go through rooms and stuff. But the smaller event that we had this year, which was kind of like not, not secondary at all, but almost like its own separate event um, was smaller because we weren't hosting the whole, you know, group from, from the earlier years. Uh, so it was only, I think about 200 people showed up, but um, it was just sets of talks, I think for two days about, uh, on, you know, and people were delivering talks throughout the day lectures, usually in small groups, you know, three lecture sets. 20 minutes each. Um, and again, same tracks and everything. And some of it was work that people submitted to the face to face, but then for whatever reason, they couldn't, they couldn't go, they got sick or there were, so they, they postponed or they, you know, couldn't, couldn't make it to New Orleans. So they were able to kick it over to the virtual. And then there was other, we had like a little brief window where some student work could be submitted. And, um, so we just kind of gathered together work that was not able to be presented at the main conference and, Kind of put together this kind of separate event with those talks and lectures uh, for this year. Now I don't know what will happen in the future. So that event was kind of very different this year than the last two ones. If that makes sense, I don't know if it made sense there, but um, yeah, and and separately. And in, so in terms of the difference between sort of the physical event this year and the virtual event this year, it sounds like there wasn't a whole lot of overlap, unless you know you're counting the cases in which somebody couldn't present in person. It sounds like it's 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 all its own whole thing right correct it, it was it was new it was separate research i think a couple of people got invited to either submit an extension or if there's a good talk i think we might have had a couple of folks that present new orleans present but yeah no it was all novel work so it was all different for the most part probably 90 percent from the face-to-face -face conference so there was some i guess appeal if you really want to like you know, hear about everything that happened this year and human factors in healthcare that anyone submitted for presentations or lectures going to both events was maybe something you'd want to do. Um, definitely. But I, you know, I guess it depends on what your research areas are. You could look at the program ahead of time. So I think it just depends on what you're trying to find and get out of the conference. Right. So I think some people are very appeased, but with the social aspect going to the face-to-face -face conference that wouldn't happen with virtual. So those people all dropped out, right. Because they got their fill from New Orleans, maybe. Um, right. So I saw a little bit of overlap of people who were very hungry for more content, plus folks who just couldn't make the face to face event. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what that Venn diagram looks like of, of physical attendees. Versus yeah, that's something we might want to look into. It's kind of hard because we have um, a lot of folks aren't members. They're just they just come to the conference. They're you know outside, and we have their names and emails and stuff. You know, some of the MDs and nurses that come, and, but you know they're not necessarily human factors HFES members, and so we can't. It's not the same as knowing like who attends what if they're an HFES member. Uh, it's a little right. harder to track them. Um, so, 
Yeah. So uh, were there any sort of key takeaways from either the physical event or the virtual event that, I don't know, resonated with you, you want to take forward in your own research? Yeah, there's a couple things. Um, during the conference, everyone was talking about the Redonda bot case that happened back. Well, it's four years old now, but it's this nurse case where this um, nurse was involved in a medication error and lost a patient. And I feel like that was kind of everyone was talking about it because um, some of the testimony had come out. And she's about to be convicted and she got charged with homicide. And so that was a kind of hot topic during that. And I'm actually writing a paper about it um, right now. And that was just something that was kind of. I, I heard about it at the conference, but it had happened years ago, and I was just floored by that because it kind of sets us back a couple of decades, honestly. Uh, there was a lot of good, talk, you know, very positive things, Nick, were that the jobs for students and like new professionals were everywhere. I felt like there were so many internships and jobs in our students. Uh, many of our students landed internships at the conference, which is really awesome. So what a what a good place for the you know young folks trying to find their career path to, to go to this conference. That's exactly what a conference should do is provide scientific content and networking. And the network opportunities for jobs was just really compelling. Um, and then I guess it was good just to see folks I hadn't seen in a couple of years and like everyone's do, you know doing their thing still and like the research had picked back up. So it was it was exciting to be there. But we all still had masks on and people you know were vaccinated. You know and vaccine card. It was still that that shadow of the pandemic was there and. It was smaller than it's been in you know the p previous face-to-face -face years, obviously. So I'm hoping it grows even more next year, which is in Orlando. So um, anyway, yeah, that sounds. I mean, that sounds awesome. Uh, question for you: Is there is there an on-site career center like there is at HFES, or is it uh, I, just like through connections that they got these jobs? No, I, I, there is. I believe we started the online career center maybe the year before the pandemic started, and. Um, I believe there is Nick and I do not remember if it was like a specific room. We also have like, um, there's like a board where you can post jobs and then you can go and like drop your resume into an envelope and then the person posting the job can look through them and schedule interviews with you. I believe we had something like that, but I don't remember Nick. And I apologize for that. I don't remember if we had a separate room this year. Um, if we don't, we, we definitely need one, but I cannot remember. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's still really encouraging that, with or without, you know, that, that there's still so many um, success stories from from yeah. uh, new grads or even students that are getting internships and, and yes. jobs in the field. That's awesome. I think it's exciting that companies know that they can, they can come there to get competent HF workers. And that's really exciting in the sense of these medical device companies and a variety of medical companies and, and organizations and hospitals. Uh, you know, they hire our folks. Uh, we probably have more embedded HF folks now than we've ever had in regards to working in hospitals and they very well likely got connected to that through you know hfes I, I would imagine a lot of them met people that had impacts on their career at this conference which is really exciting so yeah so let's let's pivot away from the conference a little bit because sure. i want to talk to you about sort of the current state of human factors healthcare and then kind of where we're going in the future right yeah. like the healthcare covers so much and so i don't even know where to start with this you know we've covered topics on the show like where uh paramedics have jetpacks and they're going to help people you know in in the uk and then there's also stories where like um i guess just a couple of weeks ago we talked about uh putting quote unquote robots in in uh seniors' homes to help with some of that loneliness that they experience. And so, you know, those kind of are wrapped up in healthcare. But from your perspective, I'm really curious on where you see the field right now and kind of where we're going in the next few years. That's really great question. It's a very difficult question to answer, Nick. I actually recently wrote a paper in the Journal of Human Factors about some industry demands and future paths. Um, I guess coming from my background, I'm a kind of a teams guy. Uh, and a simulation based training guy. So like I kind of look at the world's that lens and I also got into kind of error and error management stuff in the last decade or so. Uh, and my main area I study is mainly handoffs, which is care transitions. So I, let me back up a bit instead of like what I do, maybe more broadly, I think HF can kind of be involved in medicine in a variety of ways. You brought up a couple, uh, examples of, you know, technology. So, uh, a lot of students end up in jobs and i always think of students as because i'm a professor but working with like 
either companies on one side, like working for the FDA or working for the companies to get FDA approvals. There's like a human factors need there. There's almost a, uh, the FDA requires like human factors testing for risks for medical devices. So if you're making a new medical device, you need an HF person in your loop, in your group or your team to help you test for risk. And, and there's some of us who've made entire careers doing this and there's a variety of companies that do this. So that's kind of like what I would call like the industry, you know, FDA and, and medical device path. Then there's kind of like the embedded human factors path, which, you know, I don't even feel like existed when I was graduating in 2011, with my PhD. I didn't even know this was a job you could get. And I think that the amount of people doing this has probably grown exponentially in the last decade or so. But this is where you're an HF person who is embedded in a hospital and you work alongside their like patient safety office and risk management folks and provide knowledge and scientific um, you know, stuff to their, their uh, safety folks. And so you do patient safety research, you help run RCAs, which are root cause analyses, you help investigate errors in the hospital, maybe you help with device design or device acquisition. Um, then there's kind of like government jobs, obviously you could go work for the CDC. I don't know how many HF people do that, but I'm sure there's some work there. You could probably work for uh, National Cancer Institute or National Institutes of Health. Uh, and then there's kind of like the academic medical center or the full academic like I am, like where you're either an, you know, an HF person doing research with an academic medical center, kind of like folks that work at Johns Hopkins. There's a bunch of us at the Armstrong Institute that do HF research alongside the doctors at Johns Hopkins, which is similar to the embedded, but it's different because it's an academic appointment and it's usually got some kind of bent to it. You have to get grants and, and publish. And then kind of what I do, which is similar to that, but I'm in a HF department, not a medical. And so all of our medical work is like outside of, you know, with partnerships, not directly at my university for instance, both though some of us might be. So I see like, those are some of the places where HF like intervenes with medicine. So it's kind of in like designing de you know, devices, developing you know, simulation-based training and, and, and evaluating those things, evaluating teams in medicine, safety management, error management, um, in hospital, you know, ergonomics and improvement. I feel like I rattle off here for, for a long time. There's also the whole at-home health thing, which is way outside of what I do, but then there's the whole, like kind of what you were mentioning with the in-home robot there's a lot of folks that do at home health and research on how to improve, you know, yeah, older adults, people who can't leave their homes, uh, people with disabilities. Um, there's probably, you know, an endless variety of HF applications in those domains as well. Um, so I would, so I, you know, I'm just kind of haphazardly going through this, but th those seem to be the major areas and it kind of aligns with our tracks to a degree, not quite, but it's like kind of medical devices, patient safety to some degree, hospital designs and environment. Um, you know, clinical decision making, at home health, telehealth. Uh, these are the major areas I see HF really intervening, at least on the very applied side. Like this is where maybe someone gets a PhD or a master's in HF and they, they go work for a company helping design robotic surgery units or help design simulation based training for medical school. Or so, and I don't know if I answered your question. So, no, um, you did, so. you did, and it's it's totally okay that you're answering it kind of haphazardly, as you said, okay. uh, because I think you just illustrated the entire reason why it, th there's a need for an entirely separate conference is because it's, it's almost its own, it is its own subdomain of human factors. And there's yes. almost everything that you can do in human factors can apply to healthcare and, um, in some way, shape or form, even stuff that, you know, is, is being applied in other domains, uh, you know, I, I'd imagine there's some things in surface transportation that design of ambulance could learn from, or, you know, like anything like that. And so um, the fact that you've kind of addressed all of that in, in just one comment is, is enough to say, yes, there, there is a need for this uh, entire um, conference based on the subdomain. And especially when, you know, people's lives are at stake here. Uh, <laughs> that's also something right. to consider. Um, one one sort of follow-up question I had for you, um, a lot of the stuff that you were talking about and it, it w sounded more centered towards, um, you know, um, American, uh, a lot of three letter agencies, um, and, and it is an international symposium and it's just to answer my curiosity. And because I know Barry, uh, my traditional co-host would ask about, you know, what, what international, uh, brings to the table, like what types of things do you see from the international presenters at, at this conference? Sure. Um, you know, our international presence could probably be larger. It's probably tough for people to come for a two-day conference. It's short, right? So I don't know if that limits us. But we do have a couple of international researchers, like SQ comes to mind, who is a patient safety researcher. And one of these 
embedded HF folks. Um, he was one of the first ones I, I met in regards to being like HF in a hospital system. He's in a pediatric uh, system in Southeast Asia. And so he does, you know, hospital safety, HF research and application in a live hospital environment. Every day he's being faced with different challenges. So I think of SQ, I, he doesn't come to our conference, but a pretty impactful writer in our area is like Sydney Decker. He's in Australia. So he's, an, he's a, um, I believe he's actually Swedish, but he's a former graduate of uh, the Ohio State HF uh, or cognitive engineering program and is a pretty prolific writer. And I think a lot of his safety ideas have kind of, kind of made their way to non HF folks that read about safety and HF. And so like something, he's got a couple of books that I believe might be one of the first things like an MD that's learning about HF reads. And so I think he's a really important international contributor to us. Um, but you know, Nick, I, I think we could probably do a little bit better of a job of having more international folks attend and, um, um, kind of collaborate with, it's probably tough. Again, I think the conference might be a little short for someone to fly across the world to come for two days. And maybe that's one of the you know things that's limiting. I do believe our international presence boosted quite a bit when we had the online conference in 2020. Uh, we do have a lot of Canadian um, folks that come because you know, they're right next door. And we have quite a few Canadian researchers that have both been track chairs and have sponsored um, the conference in the past. So that's another international group that's pretty prevalent. Um, but outside of that, you know, I can't really think of too many. And I apologize. And, you know, Tony, I bet you Tony Andre could probably think of more than I can. So um. that guy's an encyclopedia. Uh, <laughs> so I want to touch on sort of the future of healthcare because yeah, yeah. we've talked, we talked a lot about, uh, at least on the show, um, like some of these very, I don't know, they seem, they seem far-fetched in some ways, but are not so far-fetched in a lot of ways too, right? Like, uh, like being able to, um, identify, uh, I don't know, certain diagnoses through the use of AI, uh, or anything like that. And I know, um, we're, we're kind of working secretly behind the scenes here on, uh, you know, AI in healthcare, um, and, cool. and what the, what the human factors connection to that is. And so, uh, stay tuned for that, I guess, tease, really but, <laughs> but, um, you know, we're, we're working on things and, and I find it interesting that, uh, you have sort of this digital assistant, you have all the, like, I don't know, the traditional issues of trust with an automated agent or automated system that you're going to have to not only figure out for like the doctor, but also for the patient and how does all that trust play into this, all that stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I really like the AI aspect, but that's one slice of the future and where the domain can go. What is like the most out there thing that you've heard of that's like, oh, that's going to be a game changer someday when when we figure that out? I mean, out there, I'm thinking like, you know, robotic surgery in a long duration space flight or something like that. Hopefully that never has to happen. Like that's something that's like really crazy out there, um, yeah. but not really practical. Right. So when I think kind of future 10, 15, 20 years out, I think about well, I think about like how so much still needs to change right now. And like, just, we're going to keep, let me back up. We like to throw technology at problems. It's common to do that. And I think oftentimes yeah. we don't know what the problem is well enough to put the right technology in the right place and have it designed correctly for the issues that are at hand. Um, and so I see both great benefits and major issues arising with things like telemedicine and use to tell medicine. Uh, I think that with, and, and this is related to the paper I told you about earlier, which I'm happy to send you, um, that I wrote I guess earlier this year, um, that when, as our population ages, we're going to have a lot more people using telemedicine because they don't leave their home or they can't drive anymore. And the, you know, the geriatric population in the United States is going to grow very you know, large by 2050. We're, um, I don't have the exact numbers off my head, but it's going to be a huge strain on our medical system. So we're going to have to rely on things like maybe robotic ambulances, uh, telemedical, uh, you know, consulting instead of ever going to a doctor again, you're doing everything online, um, uh, more advanced robotic surgeries and advanced robotic procedures and use of robots in other ways. Maybe 
robotic nurses and robotic assistants, those already exist. There are already hospitals using robots in pretty complex ways. So how are those going to change? And, uh, uh, you know, I used to study human robot teaming for the military, human robot teaming for medicine, I think is kind of just starting to be looked at. Uh, we obviously there's been a lot of robotic surgeries over the last two decades, but I mean, in a more complex way when we have maybe AI or more intelligent robotics that do decision making and maybe intervene or do things that are unexpected. And so what does that kind of team look like? Um, how do you train people to prepare to deal with a complex robotic system um, that's you know, making decisions alongside them and, and doing things that maybe they don't quite understand? Like, so it gets back to automation and mode awareness stuff, right? Kind of core human factors ideas. Um, so I think that those are a couple of things. I think error management and error mitigation is a big one. Um, there's a whole there's this kind of philosophy like safety one and safety two philosophy. I've even heard now there's safety three. And these are just different kinds of ways of approaching errors, kind of safety one. And I'm really shorthanding this, but is it very much about like finding out what errors are existing and kind of counting them and trying to figure out like where the errors are happening. Safety two is much more being proactive and building systems that are kind of designed to be resilient to error. And so that they're kind of like have a catch, you know, factors of safety built in ahead of time. So errors can't be as damaging. And now people are saying safety three, which is kind of like a socio-technical approach and considers both. And I don't know, these ideas to me, it really comes down to like, how many resources do these hospitals have? But but my point being is that error management is in fluctuation. Like the Redonda Ball case I was talking about, um, she reported the medical error voluntarily and now she got you know convicted of homicide. I think that set us back two decades in some ways. I think there's a lot of nurses and medical providers out there scared to death to report an error, but reporting errors is how we understand where there's potential flaws in the system, where there's potential devices that aren't useful, where there's potential processes that are problematic or unsafe. So I think that there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, uh, and I, unfortunately, I feel like this recent event, and it's only one event, but it was really widely popular, just like pushed us back like so far because we feel like you know part of it's convincing people it's okay to talk about errors. It's okay. It's not you're not a bad provider because your patient died on you. That could be for a variety of reasons. Um, you're working with sick people and in a complex system that's not necessarily safe. And so I feel like uh, kind of changing the mindset of medicine in a way to be more like us is, is something that I see happening and is going to take decades probably. But I would love every medical provider to get a, a, a bit of a human factors education along their path to go, you know, errors happen not because I'm bad at my job, but because I'm in a complex socio-technical system that's loosely coupled and there's all these things that go wrong because people are sick and hurt when they come to the hospital. So, um, so I can keep going. Nick, I yeah. can talk about <laughs> that. Me. Um, I mean, you've certainly give us, given us a lot to think about. I mean, you know, I, I do want to comment on just a couple things. One, this is exactly why we're human factors. People is because we, we look at these technical approaches uh, or technical solutions to to some of these problems, and we immediately step back and say, "Okay, well, what does it take to get the human on board with these uh, technical advances? What does it mean right. for somebody to use this in conjunction with how they're doing the processes today?" And then, you know, also there's kind of the other approach of like, "Well, there's going to be a robot conducting surgery on you. What happens if they make a mistake or AI makes a mistake? Is it the the person who wrote the AI? Is it a collective?" Um, sort of uh, finger pointing at a company that has developed it, or is it the, you know, individual developer that's made that coding error in there? Like, so there's all these other, not just um, process procedure, but policy and, and really just understanding about how we're going to approach these problems in the future. And the second point I'll make is all that means that we have some job security. So that's <laughs> also <laughs> kind of comforting uh, in some ways. Uh, I agree. It yeah. Is, it's, well, yes, it's comforting, but it's also like man, I feel like there's like so much work to do, and uh, there's not enough of us. We need more HF people, um, more now than ever, maybe. And uh, we're so important to a variety of domains, but I think medicine's hungry for our work. I feel like it's this is just like starting. You know, to me, uh, you know, in this again, I'm referring to this paper. I, I did this um, Google Dimensions Analytics on. HF publications and, and with healthcare, so HF plus healthcare. And uh, it went from like nothing in the 70s to, you know, 20,000 last year or something. So we just had this exponential rise 
starting the, the rise, if you look, is around 2000, 2001 mark. It starts to kind of skyrocket. Uh, clearly, there's something right here. And so I'm just, I'm very hopeful. Um, but it's just hard. Uh, it's hard to kind of, I don't want to say sell our science to convince people that this is val valid and valuable. And I feel like most people get a concept of what we do and don't even understand it well enough to like know how valuable it is, you know? So um, probably need a little bit of a marketing and branding thing there. But I, I spoke to my, my friend, Mike Rosen, who's at Johns Hopkins probably about a year ago. And we were talking about this very problem of like kind of how do we brand ourselves because most of us are trained in such diverse areas. You know, you got one guy or gal, who's an expert in automation, another one who's an expert in error management, another one who is in driving, and another one who is, you know, robotics. And we all have these different backgrounds in HF. And so when you then outward face to a hospital, it's like, well, what background, you know, how does this guy that does robotics and, and this gal that does automation, like, they're very different people in my mind. So, and it's not necessarily like, I don't know, branding problem for HF, but it's just that, like, we have such diverse backgrounds that it's not always, you know, the same degree does not always equal the same skill set. And I think that that in some ways is probably difficult for hospitals and organizations to understand in the, in the medical community. Um, perhaps I'm speculating. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do understand a lot of that. You know, it's, there's a lot of work to be done, not only in the field, but within explaining the importance of the field. And I feel like that is a battle that we are continuously fighting. Uh, and so with that, do you have any other closing thoughts about the healthcare symposium, future of healthcare, uh, human factors, anything? I think the future is pretty bright. Um, I think that, uh, the conference is going to keep growing. Um, we don't want to get huge cause we like how it's small and intimate and easy to meet people. So I think that, you know, if we ended up being a conference that sits around 600 people, 700 people each year, that'd be awesome but we are fine with 400 if that's what it ends up being. You know, I think that there's this community of people that always show up. So conference is great. And um, we have now brought Dr. Tara Cohen in from Cedar sinai who is going to be assisting me and Tony and eventually take the conference over down the road. I'm, I'm still on board for, for a few more years and Tara's great. So she's already worked with me and Tony. So it's going to be in good hands, at least for the foreseeable future. And then the field itself and HF, I just feel like there's it just, the jobs and the opportunities are just vast. So I see so much opportunity and, and potential for growth for our field and for students in this field to get amazing careers and do really amazing, critically important, you know, work to save people's lives in some instances. Uh, so, you know, couldn't be more exciting than that for, for an HF engineer or psychologist. So. Yeah. Well, you know what you could always do is if you, if the conference does blow up, you could always split it off again. And <laughs> there you go. It's a lot of work. Uh, maybe one day. <laughs> True, Nick. I mean, already, you know, yeah, there's already large things happening within the conference. You already see that certain areas are really popular. So you, you, know, you might be on something there. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for today, everyone. If you like this coverage, want to hear more from Joe, go check out our interview with him from 2019. So you can see how the conference has grown and some of his research interests he talks about in that interview as well. Comment wherever you're listening with what you think of uh, the coverage. For more in-depth discussion, you can always join us on our Discord community. You can visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show, there's a couple things you can do. One, you can leave us a five-star review wherever you're watching or listening right now. Two, you can tell your friends about us. Word of mouth really helps us grow. And three, if you're able to, uh, if you're financially able to consider supporting us on Patreon, that really helps for uh, contributing to some of the show costs and making sure that we stay afloat and my pocketbook empty. Uh, so, and as always, links to all of our socials and our website are in the description of this episode. I want to thank Joe Keebler for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk more about uh, the healthcare symposium? Uh, you can find my LinkedIn page under Joseph Keebler. You can find me at Embry-Riddle Aeronautic University's webpage on the Department of Human Factors in Daytona Beach. Uh, and I also have Google Scholar. Uh, if you want to look up any of my publications, I'm easy to find on there. My profile is everything I've ever published on there. So, Awesome. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on our Discord and across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, Joe, you've been on the show before. You know we say it depends at the end. Ready? One, two, three. It depends. It depends. Ha, ha, ha.